Good morning, Pastor Gene Oller here at Word of Hope Church in Katy's, Kentucky. We're glad you guys join us on Facebook and YouTube and uh, want to just encourage you to uh, stay with us. Keep following us if you can. If you would, share and comment and like. Let people know even right now that you're watching. Let your friends know. And also, I want to make you aware that at the end of the service, we're going to take communion. So if you've got a chance to get uh, some type of juice and some type of bread or cracker or water, whatever it is you have, you're welcome to join us in communion. Communion's not for people. It's not just for people that are a member of our local church. It's anybody that's born again. Uh, we get born again. We're a part of the family of God, and we can take communion together. So glad to have our uh, in-person local folks with us today. God bless you all, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, just honoring God today as we talk about we remember, and what we're remembering today is Christ and his sacrifice according to the scriptures. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your wonderful faithfulness and goodness and mercy, God, for your your continued love, Lord, for your, oh, Lord, for being such a great father to your children. And, Lord, today we pray, Lord, for those that don't know you, that they might come to know you, Lord. For those that are discouraged, Lord, that they might, uh, Lord, look to you as the author and finisher of their salvation. God, as the help, Lord. Oh, Lord, I re I'm reminded in Psalms where it says, when I'm overwhelmed, I run to the rock that is higher than you. And, God, we run to you. We look to you today. Lord, I pray that you would anoint, God, and, and uh, help, Lord, these words of mine, Lord to be of, Lord, for your glory and benefit to your people, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to, our text, our scripture today is going to be from 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. And uh, today we want to talk a little bit about communion, what it's all about. And, and we remember Christ's sacrifice. And, you know, we think of, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, and yes, what a sacrifice. I mean, he gave the last ounce and measure of devotion. He shed all of his blood so that you and I could be born again. The scripture says that the blood of Christ washes us from our sins. The blood of Christ somehow, uh, Jesus told Mary in the garden, said, don't touch me yet. I've not went to the Father. Because he was going to go to the Father and then come back and, and visit with the disciples and remain on the earth, uh, you know, for some 40 days and, and share the gospel with his followers. Some 500 witnessed him during that time, the scripture says. But uh, this his sacrifice was not just on the cross. And, and then we remember, of course, the Via Della Rosa carrying the cross two miles, the weight of that after the suffering of 39 stripes, not with a buggy whip but with a woven tool of torture designed to get confession from people. And what a horrible uh, physical abuse that was to his body. Uh, tradition, not, not in the scriptures, but Roman tradition or Roman writings tell us that sometimes men died when they were scourged. The 39 stripes took their life. Uh, it bore your... It tore the flesh off your back. It exposed your backbone and your ribs. It, it uh, you know, uh, was a very brutal beating that took somewhere from one to two hours. And if you passed out, they threw water in your face and woke you up so you were fully conscious to make sure you wouldn't miss any of the torture. And then before that, though, there's the garden where Jesus agonized to the level of praying and crying out to God that he fell on his face. He, he laid in the dirt and cried out to God and his face began to bleed. The capillaries, the blood vessels broke around his eyes and his face and, and he, was, he was bleeding, agonizing with God because he didn't want to go to the cross, because he did not want to die like that. Three times he said, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But then he said three times, nevertheless, Father, your will be done, not mine. We're all going to face times in our lives where we're challenged with what God wants from us. God call upon our life it can be very demanding sometimes. I challenge you to cry out to God. God, is there something 
you want me to do that I'm not doing? God, is there a direction for my life that I don't want that you want? Is there something, God, that I was created for that I don't want to do and I've ignored it? You see, Jesus endured what he endured. No, no, he's told, he told him, he said, I was born for this reason. For this reason, I came into the world, but he still did not want to die on the cross. He didn't want to suffer like that. In the very beginning of his ministry, Satan came to him as he was finishing a 40-day fast after his baptism. And after the infilling, the Holy Spirit came upon him and remained on him, the scripture says. And Satan tempted him three times. One with bread, of course, because he was hungry. Turn these stones to bread. One with uh, glory and honor and worship that people, that he would have all, all these kingdoms, that he would be given all power. You see, he denied the shortcut. He wouldn't take the shortcut. He came. Uh, you know, he came into the world to, to subdue all kingdoms and all power. He came to destroy the works of Satan. But he wasn't going to do it through force, and he wasn't going to do it through worshiping Satan. He was going to do it through humility, through loving his enemies, through goodness and mercy, through kindness. He was going to do it through rejection. He would be rejected. He would be mistreated. He would be betrayed. He would be sold for 30 pieces of silver, the price of the cheapest of slaves. He would be forsaken. Even in the garden, even in the garden, no one would pray with him. They all fell asleep. They all fell asleep. But Jesus chose to obey the Father at all costs. And I want to tell you today, in reality, he asked no less of me and you. It's not going to be a wooden cross. But it may be something that we are not interested in doing. It might be something that we don't want to do. I remember when God called me to preach, I barely could read. And I, I said, God, nobody would want to hear me. And people said, nobody would want to hear you. And I thought, God, there's all kinds of people that could preach the gospel better. There are people that understand more, that know more, that are smarter. God takes the foolish things of the world and it brings confusion, the scripture says, to the wise on why he picks and chooses who he chooses. Now, he chooses some that are incredibly qualified, like the Apostle Paul, educated to the highest standards, born in the right family, but he picks some up out of the gutter and uses them for his purpose and glory. Now, I don't know what it is God wants for us but I want to tell you this today. What Christ did in his life, miracles, teachings, betrayal, death, burial, and resurrection paid for your life and mine. When you get born again, the Bible says you've been paid for with the precious blood of Christ. You owed a debt you could not pay. He paid a debt he did not. Oh, he washed our sins away, a debt of love. And, and I, I'm quite sure as I've read the writings of hundreds of missionaries and even have read the writings of those whose lives have been taken directly for the cause of Christ. And in Bangladesh, where I had the opportunity to sit at tables and eat with people that had been tortured for their faith, literally, who's had their lives, you know, kidnapped and they tried to murder them and they survived, who had family members who died for Christ, moms and dads who forsook them and threw them out because they knew Christ, jobs that were taken away because they, pronounced, they professed Christ, all manner of suffering, humiliation, rejection. I realize as an American, I have given so very little. I've done so very little for the Lord. I don't say that to guilt us, but I do think that it ought to be a prayer, a cry of our hearts. God, is there something I can do? Is there something I'm missing? Lord, is there a direction you want me to go? Is there a lifestyle change, an occupation change? 
Or maybe, God, you want me to be secluded and spend lots of time in praying and crying out and interceding for the world. What is it, God, that you want me to do? Certainly, he wants us all to be found faithful. Certainly, we're all called to be bold witnesses. Certainly, we're called to pray for the sick, to clothe the naked, to make a difference in our generation, our time. That's everybody, for sure. And it's enough if it's what he's leading you to do. God might lead you in directions that, you know, you never would think to go. I think it was uh, Livingston, the great missionary. His brother became a doctor, and, and uh, he himself was in, you know, college. And, and he said, I'm going to be a missionary. And his brother said, you're throwing your life away. Why do that? Why do that? It's a waste. But he didn't want to be a doctor anymore. He wanted to be a missionary. And he went to Africa and he died in Africa. Gave his life for the cause of Christ. Today you can look up Livingston in an encyclopedia. And there will be a few paragraphs about, you know, uh, uh, columns about his life. Or at least in other encyclopedias it was in the past. I know we're changing our history nowadays. But you'll find one little line. And it mentions his brother's name. It just says, and his brother, and has his brother's name. I, I think that there's greater honor in the cause of Christ no matter what people say. So we look today at Christ's death. We're not going to go through the details any more than we already have. But the death of Christ is what he's calling us to remember. First Corinthians 1123, Paul speaking here. He said, I received from the Lord. He didn't get it from the other apostles. He wasn't at the Lord's Supper. He wasn't there when Jesus washed the feet or when Christ was in the garden praying or betrayed or arrested or the trials. But he said, I received something from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, who said, I am an apostle born at the different time, born in a strange season, born after the resurrection of Christ. But I know him. But I know him, Paul said, and I want to know him more. I want to be conformed to his suffering. I want to know what it's like to know him better at all costs. He said, the Lord told me how communion is supposed to be done. And he's the only one that wrote about it. Isn't that something? He said, I received of the Lord that which also I've told you. He, he had already written to the Corinthian church. He had already told the Corinthian church. But they were a church of problems. That the Lord Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. I want to note something here. That in the night which he was betrayed, having already said to Judas, go and do quickly what you must do. Having already said uh, at the table, someone here with me is going to betray me. He that dips the bread in the, in the sop with me. Jesus, I scared at that moment, was dipping. In that night, in that night, he gave thanks. He gave thanks. It's no wonder to me that Paul over and over and over and over again talks about giving thanks, telling us to give thanks, or quite frankly, he's always giving thanks. And he was a man tortured for his faith. And I went through that list so many times, you may be weary of it, so I won't today. But a man who was tortured enormously for his faith in Christ. In that night, he gave thanks, Jesus did. Breaking the bread and saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're proclaiming, you're demonstrating, you're declaring his death until he returns. <clears throat> Some will say, well, when he resurrected, he had returned and and maybe that's what he's talking about. I think for us, he's talking about that return someday in the future. 
It isn't that the resurrection isn't important, but this must not be missed. He'd already taught and preached that he was going to raise from the dead. He rose people from the dead. He said as Jonah was in the belly of the earth, or as Jonah was in the belly of the well three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. He wasn't in heaven during those three days and nights. He was in hell preaching the gospel according to Peter and mentioned in Ephesians, setting captives free. He said, as often as you take this bread and drink out of this cup, a set-aside moment at a meal or like today coming together in this service, as you're doing that, what I want you to remember is my death till I come back. Continual memorial. Not that he's not a living Savior. Not that you can't know Christ alive in your life today. He lives in me through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's seated beside the Father. He's not suffering. He's not on a cross. He's not in a tomb. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. Name above every name. Every knee and tongue will bow and confess that he's Lord. But he said, I want you in the church 2,000 years ago and in the church in 2021 to remember my death. Paul says that's the very reason why we take communion. Now, some of you will remember that in John's gospel, Jesus had fed 15,000 possible, 5,000 plus men and women. And the next day they came back and they said, what's for lunch today? And Jesus said, oh my goodness, you guys are not here because you believe in my father. You're only here because you had a good fish sandwich yesterday. And, and you know, they, they wanted more food. And so they got smart aleck with him. They said, well, Moses gave us manna every day. And he said, no, no. He said, Moses didn't give you manna. My father gave you manna. And I don't know. I don't know if you connect the pieces. I like to look at all that's going on. So then he preaches a message. I mean, he talks to him a little more. And the message that he preaches is sort of about food. He said to that group of people, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you aren't going to go to heaven. And guess what happened? Everybody got their little lawn chair and went home. They all went home. They left. And the scripture says he turned around to the 12 and he said, are you guys going to? I'm always amazed at the incredible character, strength, determination, and desire to fulfill God's purpose for his life. Because you see, I'm a preacher. When everybody gets mad and walks out, I feel terrible. I don't know that he didn't feel bad, but he asked them, are you going too? Maybe he was feeling bad. Maybe he was saying, are you going too? But I think as long as he made his father happy, he's okay. And he proved it all the way to the cross. And they said, no, no, we're going to stay with you. Peter said, oh, you alone have the words of life. They had no idea what they were talking about, but they knew whenever he spoke, there was something. And I tell you, to everybody that's hungry, to everybody that's thirsting, for everybody that wants to know the truth, if you will listen, Jesus said, if you have ears to hear, hear. If you'll listen, if you'll desire, if you'll hunger and thirst, you'll begin to hear those words and they'll have meaning and understanding in your life. Yeah, it's strange that the Lord's Supper is not really about his return. It mentions the return, but it is a reminder to remember his death. And I think it's very important. Very important. <clears throat> the cross, I want, I, want, I want to read something to you. Tried to type it in my notes today, but I couldn't get it done. So I'll just read it to you. How many of you know who Johnny Erickson Tatata is? She was a Olympic hopeful. She was a swimmer, and she was young and, and going to be in the Olympics. And she was diving uh, in a not not in a pool, but in an area that they swam in, like a quarry. And she broke her neck, and from then until this day, about 50 years, nearly. She has been limited to a wheelchair, paralyzed from the neck down. And uh, she wrote this. She said that she experienced both the death of Jesus and the life of Jesus. 
the suffering, to see things not going to work out, the dying to self. That's what she's talking about. So she said this, the cross is the center of our relationship with Jesus. The cross is where we die. We go there daily, and it isn't easy. Normally, we'll follow Christ anywhere. How many of you, you know, said that before? Oh, Lord, anywhere. It turns out anywhere but maybe there or there. Normally, we'll follow Christ anywhere, going to a party, as it were, when he changed the water into wine. We love those kind of days. A sunlit beach where he preaches from a boat. But to the cross? To the cross, are we willing to go there? Does he want us to? Indeed, he does. We dig our heels in. The invitation is so frightfully individual. You see, Christianity is a mass big thing. There are millions, some say, two billion believers in the world today. About eight billion people. I don't know how high the numbers are. Some say that. But I do know that nearly half of those people that aren't saved haven't heard the gospel. And that's for sure. And that's my job. And probably yours as well. And by the way, thank you for all that this church does for missions. That missionary that was here a few weeks ago could not believe the offering that you all gave and monthly support that we committed. He said, I was in a church of 600. I know that pastor. He's a great pastor. Their church does a lot of missions. But he said, he said their offering was nowhere as big as your offering. And he said they, they committed to less. Yeah. Need to be careful, don't I? I'm on Facebook. Hello. <laughs> Forgot to stripe that out a little bit. Who said that? It's the microphone. It's not me. But Christianity is not about a big club or a great church. Those are wonderful, by the way. I would to God that our church, uh, you know, had 250 people. That'd be great. I'd love to have the doors open and 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 uh, have to have people in the parking lots. Love to have speakers. You know, whatever. I just, not so I could be a pastor of a bigger church, but because the gospel would be going further. But Christianity, she wrote, is frightfully individual. You see, at the cross, it's just you and Jesus. And what does he want you to do? I mean, God really wants us to do things, but I'll promise you this. We usually set the bar, and we kind of got some no's. We got some areas. We're not going to go any further than that. We're unwilling to give this up or make that change or take that on. And then one of the most terrible things about Christ is that sometimes he'll ask you to do what you cannot do. Moses part the Red Sea, tough thing for a man to do. He made it possible. Gideon with 300 soldiers conquer an army of 135,000. Impossible. David kill a giant. Impossible. Christ come back from the dead. Impossible. At the cross, when we're really there, you know, we can we can play cross, we can we can go there and say a little thing, but if we pour our heart out, it doesn't have to be like that big wooden one there. The cross could be in your house, in the chair, in the floor. I don't know if it can be driving, because the cross usually It's too much that I would not be able to drive a car while I was experiencing the cross. Maybe you've never experienced the cross. But there, it's naked. Everything stripped away. And Johnny learned and experienced that for months in what back in those days was called the iron lung. You know, she had to live inside of a thing that helped her breathe. And she would beg her friends, her college friends and friends that would come see her that she grew up with, Unplug it. She cried out, unplug it. I don't want to live like this. She knew she was a power outage from dying, and she welcomed that. Her friends wouldn't do it. Many quit visiting, of course, because they couldn't stand to see her like that. Well, technology changed. A lot's happened, so she's been mobile in a wheelchair for all these years now. But it's tough. Suffering reduces us to nothing. God creates everything that he's ever created out of nothing. Everything which God is to use, he first reduces to nothing. 
How many of you know we don't like that? We don't like that. To be reduced to nothing is to be dragged to the foot of the cross. It's a severe mercy of God towards us, though. When suffering forces us to our knees at the foot of the cross, we die to self. We cannot kneel there for long without releasing our pride, our anger, our dreams and desires. In exchange for that, God imparts power and implants new hope, new and lasting hope in our lives. This prayer out of the devotional says, Lord, everything in me kicks against going to the foot of the cross. When you, where you will root out of me everything that is not of you. Help me not to fear the deaths. You see, there are many deaths in the life of a believer. We die to things over and over again. New things we never thought of that have to go, have to change. It's not a bad thing, but it is a painful thing. It will take, uh, uh, help me not to fear the deaths. It will take for me to be transformed into a free person who loves you and others well. Have mercy on me, O Lord, in Jesus' name. You see, communion's about remembering his death, the sacrifice he made. We really want normal, easy Christianity. You know, we want we want to get saved and just be happy and God bless me and help me with everything that comes along. And, and Lord, I want everything my way. And we, we think sometimes maybe it's Burger King or something. God, my way. And I want to tell you, it's a wonderful blessing to know God. I'm not saying it's not. But if it's not costing something, you're shallow. If you don't find yourself crying out for mercy or crying out for help or crying out, God, take this pain from my being, then you don't understand much of what it's all about. The Christian life is the most glorious life ever, but it is never a life that is lived without a struggle. Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 26, For what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? The most important things in this life are the things of the kingdom to come. It is not the things we have here. It is not the plans and dreams that we have. Now, you know, God gives people plans and dreams. And sometimes the course that you're on may be exactly the course that God's got you on. But there has still got to be some deaths to stuff. Deaths to pride, deaths to anger, deaths to resentment, deaths to bitterness, death to what's happened in the past, death to the fears of what lies ahead. There's got to be that continual to the cross. Paul said that, that we have to be crucified with him. He said we have to mortify the body, which means crucify. It's a horrible thing. We need to go to the cross daily. Communion. The word communion, by the way, is not found in that text, but it is found in other places in the scripture. And it's found uh, in the chapter uh, before when it talks about fellowship between uh, the saved, the unsaved, the light and the dark. Uh, it talks about between idols and God. You know, there's there can't be any communion there, any fellowship. And so the word for communion uh, has several meanings, as we well know. Uh, they were speaking in Greek. When he wrote this in Greek, it doesn't quite come into our language, so it takes multiple words. It means fellowship. When you take communion, it is fellowship with believers. It is fellowship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not meant to be a ritual. It's a time. It's Another word is association. We associate together. That's another word for communion, the Greek word communion. Communi it means community, a, a group of people. We're, we're spread out, but we're, we have something in common, the cross. It means joint participation. It means intimacy with God. That word means to contribute, to distribute, to distribute, and to communicate. Communion is not the act of 
eating a little piece of bread and, and drinking. It is the act of a body of believers coming together. Now, you could take communion on your own. I certainly understand that. But communion is a connection. It's very important. To take communion, what do I have to do? We well, just have to be born again. You have to be born again. And, and uh, I'm not going to go into all the scriptures I got here. They look like some great ones, though. I'd love to do all those. But I will tell you seven things real quick. That, like so many things in the scriptures, is in a weird place. Because it's in a chapter where Paul is dealing with the people fussing among themselves. The inequalities of the rich and the poor. And their behavior at church and the length of their hair. That's all going on in that chapter. Read it. Read it. Read it carefully so you understand it. So, so the chapter that where he says, today I'm going to tell you all how the Lord told me we need to have communion is the same chapter where he's dealing with divisions, heresy, selfishness, misuse of the church, shaming the poor, partaking unworthily of the Lord's Supper and its benefits, and failure to self-examine ourselves at the foot of the cross or failure to judge our own selves. Yeah, go through later. I give you another homework assignment. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and go through there. It's a chapter of messy people. And once again, I'm so glad for that. I'm so glad for that. Wonder if Paul had put that in a chapter of everything great and everybody doing well and everybody happy and no one in the church having any problems, and no believer suffering, and nobody uh, maybe suffering economically, and, and, and you know nobody dealing with some type of issue in their lives. But you see, the Bible's to real people, born again, but still struggling. And this, the church in Corinth is a messy church. Our church is not nearly as messy as that church. I'm not giving you something to work towards, but I'm so grateful we don't have their problems. But yet, he's telling them we're going to have communion today in the midst of this mess. To the world, to the unsaved people, I want to remind you, the reason why the church is a mess is because it lets people like me in it. The church doors are open to whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. In fact, you could come to church and not know Christ. You could come to church and not believe the gospel. If you behave yourself, you could come to every service and take notes and ask questions. No matter what your beliefs are, the doors are open. Now, communion isn't possible without knowing Christ. And I'm not just talking about the cup and the bread. I'm talking about there's something special that takes place in born-again people's lives. We're family. And the world needs to see that about the church. Not just our church. But I need to get along with the people that uh, don't believe just like I do. Churches that don't think like I think. There are certain things, Christ's death, burial, resurrection, the blood of Christ. There are things that are inseparable. The gospel cannot be changed, but we don't agree on everything. And we need not to despise other people. Yeah, I'm glad the church has people in it that have problems because it means I can be a part. wonder if Brother Miller would have told me 47 years. When you get over your addiction, when you quit acting like you act, when you quit looking like you look, when you get straightened up, and get your life together, you come back and we'll pray with you to receive Jesus. My goodness, I'd still be in sin, probably in hell. He never commented about myself. He just talked about how good God was and how much God wanted us. And I got born again. So to the lost, I want to encourage you, there's room in the church for you. And you might say, well, they're hypocrites. I know they're everywhere. They're at Walmart, car dealership. Sometimes a hypocrite is me. Sometimes it's you. But there's something in the church. People that have been born again, blood bought, and we are changing. We're not the people we used to be. I'm nothing like I was 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And I'll be different in 10 more years, closer to God. Growing in love and mercy and kindness. Caring about other people more than ever before. Following Christ. That's my desire. So as we 
prepare to take communion. Hope everybody's got their cup ready. I want you to examine yourself. It doesn't mean find yourself unworthy because of something in your life that's a mess. It means, Lord, I'm struggling with this in my life, and I ask you to forgive me. Lord, I want to be included in what you're doing. If you're not comfortable taking communion today, that's okay. It's a personal thing. It's a personal thing. But we're going to take this wafer in just a moment. It isn't his body, but it represents his body. Then we're going to partake of this juice. The broken body of Christ, the life that he lived, the suffering, the 39 stripes for our healing, uh, the crown beat into his head for our peace of mind. All those things covered in the suffering of Christ. Isaiah 52, marred beyond human belief. Isaiah 53, the rejection, the dishonoring, the crucifixion, all those things represented here. In the wafer, the blood, the juice that we drink. And you can use water, cracker, bread at home, whatever you've got. This represents the blood of the Son of God, the perfect spotless lamb, the sinless lamb. He had to be a lamb without spot and blemish. But I want to tell you, they marred him horribly. But the blood was pure. And his blood alone tones for our sins. That's why there is no other way. Nobody else could offer blood for your atonement. Nobody else could live good enough. Christ alone was perfect and shed his blood. So we're going to partake of this together today. So we're going to take of the wafer first. I'm going to pray and then of the juice. Father, we thank you, Lord, as we remember your death today. We know you're alive and we celebrate the resurrection. But at communion time, we remember the death that you died. And we remember that we too must daily come to the cross, that we must pick up our cross and follow you. God, that you are leading us somewhere for your glory. And it will be good even if the way is hard. Lord, because of your sacrifice, we commit ourselves to follow you. We thank you, Lord, that you took beating, ter terrible scourging so we could be healed. And so we ask you to bless this bread representing your body to the nourishment of our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us partake. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, we have the cup with juice and symbolizing your shed blood, the perfect blood of the Lamb of God. Jesus, tempted in all points like as we were, yet you never sinned, Lord. We're so grateful. You never succumbed. You never gave in. You never surrendered to your will, but always to the Father's will. We thank you for your perfect blood that was shed for our sins. Lord, two things stand out to me so much in this moment. That you are so incredibly worthy of everything. And that you love us so indescribably great, Lord. It's incredible to me that you can love us this much. And we are totally, absolutely unworthy. Worthiness only comes through our communion, kononia, fellowship, intimacy of knowing you. Lord, forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you that your blood has purchased us. Thank you for letting us be a part of your family. Bless this to the nurse of our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. God bless you all. Thank you for joining today.